Do you have your yeah. copy of the book yet, Fraser? Nope. Did they send you one? No. Oh, Pegasus, uh, because all the distributors, all the warehouses are having trouble. So all the free freebies mm -hmm. are taking their sweet time. Oh, let me put you all in the gallery mm -hmm. view so people could see just how many people we have joining us today on this week's Weekly Space Hangout. Yay, the gang's back Yay. together. Ba, ba, ba. For today, anyway. Yeah. So a, I was a one time reunion. Uh, so, I mean, before we get into the show itself, uh, I was, I mean, obviously, I've been watching with shock and horror at the just the, the difficult time that my all of my friends in the US are having right now. Like, half of the crew right now, half of the team is, is under a curfew. And go outside if we wanted to. Yeah. That, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's I'm free the, as a bird. That's where the COVID I can do whatever is. Whatever I want. Yeah, yeah. But that's where the COVID is as well. So, I mean, just what a, what a difficult time. And I'm so sorry for, and that's a, that's a full on Canadian sorry for what you guys are going through. It is rough. Yeah. I can't, yeah. uh, I can't imagine uh, just how. Out of everybody who's going out and uh, braving it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, for the people who are, who are actually going out breaking curfew and getting arrested to protest a very important, uh, mm -hmm. a very important thing. So, yeah. 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 I, I, I just, I, I just, I like it, you know, as Canadians, we just want everyone to just get along. It just, well, please figure this out, yes. please. Um, if I could import that mentality to this country. Yeah, I know. I know I it's, uh, I was I was talking before the before the show. I, there's a really great series of interviews on the Daily, which is the New York Times podcast, mm -hmm. and they talk about uh, just the level, the the number of sort of systemic issues that are just in the system that make it so difficult to find uh, overly aggressive police officers and to actually uh, have any kind of consequences, and so. Mm -hmm. You can see that if, if it wasn't if it wasn't this week, it would have been next week. Like it's just a matter of time for this to to boil over. So, right. yeah. Oh. So for those of you who are going through any phase of this, um, you know, like I said, you you get a a Canadian sorry that you're going through this. Yeah, it feels honestly, it feels a little weird to even be talking about things like <laughs> space. You know, I know, I know, I know. Such I know, heavy stuff going on, but all the same, I think people kind of need a relief uh, to some extent, and so hopefully, you know, we're a temporary sort of distraction from yeah from all the stuff that's going on. A lot of pain, a lot of anxiety in this country right now. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's a, and there are a lot of great resources. I mean, all I've been trying to do is just try to understand. Just try to figure out what's going on, what people are going through. Um, a lot of reading, a lot of listening, a lot of just uh, reflection. And, uh, and of course, trying to support any of the people who I am able to in the U.S. as they, as they go through this. All right. Um, we're going to switch over to the actual show itself. So let me just uh, shift things around. There we go. All right. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, June the 3rd. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we've uh, got a very special guest. We've got a roundup of, uh, of news and we've got our original cast for the last couple of years of the, uh, of the Weekly Space Hangout. So joining me, we've got, of course, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly. Hello and happy podcast day to you, Paul. Hello. <laughs> we'll get him in a second. That's that's the surprise. Um, Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Ah, come on. Sorry, spoiler we've alert. Got, we've got Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. It's, uh, it's like I've magically traveled back a couple of years, and that sounds pretty good right now. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> uh, and we've got uh, Dr. Alex Tichy as well. Alex. Not doctor yet. Not, Not doctor yet. What? But... Oh, we everybody. we only yeah, produce yeah. Uh, soon, doctorates. Soon. Yeah, we. That's the thing. That's the service we provide is we have a one hundred percent success <laughs> oh, rate of. Uh, I don't know what I've been doing for the last five years. So yeah, I just needed to come on this show. Yeah, we'll get you. Yeah. We'll get you your doctorate uh, right away. Uh, now, before Appreciate we go into our special guest star today, uh, I want to take a second and, of course, thank our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. People have been asking me how can I 
bring on cool guests onto the Weekly Space Hangout? And the answer is you join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Go to wshcrew.space and they will give you your uh, access to the community and uh, all of the business card templates you require to become an executive producer of the, uh, of the Weekly Space Hangout and to bring on all the guests you like. And all the guests that you found, including today's special guest, was organized by, of course, the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Speaking of today's guest, we've got Dr. Paul Matsutter. Paul, welcome back. <gasps> wow, it has been way too long. It's so good to have you. Um, oh, feels what, good, feels what, good. What have you been up to? Oh man, I've been so busy. I have been reading. I have been um, cooking. I've been sitting Any, around. I've been just busy, really yeah. busy. Because yeah, uh, well, the word on the so street busy. is you've got a you've got a book. <laughs> I do have a new book. I yeah, I've, I do have lots of fun things going on. I'm the host of the Space Out Show on Discovery dot com. Uh, How the Universe Works on Science Channel. A few other projects cooking up, and my new book just came out yesterday and nor normally you know we would talk about the book at the end but the title the topic is so cool i really right just kind of want to dig into it right, right away here. it is how to die in space a journey through dangerous astrophysical phenomena and here it is here it is it is available in bookstores nationwide as we speak that's awesome uh, how, cool. you've been working on that book longer than the previous book haven't you it, that's right. I actually started this book many, many years ago. I think about five years ago, wrote half the chapters, uh, but then the deal, the book deal fell through. So I put it away, just put it to rest, ended up writing a whole other book, Your Place in the Universe, which came out in November of 2018. And then finally got a book deal for this, which was my original idea, and then came back to it and I had to write about uh, the the other half of it. So it's a very, it was very interesting to see the evolution of my writing from five years ago to to now. Yeah. So, uh, and do you, do you find that you had to heavily rewrite your work? You're a much better writer now yeah. than you were then. I mean, I'm much, well, I'm a much faster writer than I am now than I was five years ago. I wouldn't call, and I suppose in some sense that is better, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if the quality is any better. I made myself laugh <laughs> reading something like, well, that's pretty clever, Paul. Good job. <laughs> so, all right. So, so tell us, um, what is like the uh, give us a like a high list of the ways that space is trying to kill us? All right, yeah, yeah. So the, the what the book is how it's structured is it's an imaginary journey through the universe where um, you're you want to go out and explore, you want to leave the Earth, you want to travel through the solar system, and the galaxy, and intergalactic space. You know, do the whole universe, see all the cool stuff. This book is a trusty companion to demonstrate how all the interesting things in the universe are also trying to kill you. <laughs> so we talk about we talk about supernovae, we talk about black holes, we talk about planetary nebula, we talk about the sun itself and asteroids and comets. We get into some weird stuff. We talk about cosmic strings and the potential for hostile aliens. Uh, we we cover the whole range, and I don't know why I'm saying we. It was just me. It's just you. Yes. I don't know why I switched to the royal we. Did you get a chance to do some of the math? Because a lot of the times, like I get pretty hand wavy when it comes to things mm -hmm. that are going to kill you. Like yeah, black holes, magnetars. I've never talked about cosmic strings trying to kill you. Maybe I will after this, but I'll get back. You know, <laughs> I'll be pretty hand wavy. And we build this. Did you get to do some surprising math to figure out just how deadly some of this is at at what kinds of distances? You know, I started to do that. I wanted to st start going into it, and then I found out that it's all just stupidly easy to kill human beings, <laughs> and that it, the numbers like. Oh, as soon as you encounter an asteroid, it doesn't matter how fast it's going. It doesn't matter how big it is from the size of a pebble to the size of a mountain. It's still going to kill you. If you're anywhere close where you can actually see a magnetar, you're dead. <laughs> if you happen to be close to a supernova, it doesn't matter if it's one of the smallest supernova or a hypernova, you're dead. Yeah. There's just, there's 
it's so there's no margin for safety. So the numbers just came out ridiculous. And I, instead I just described the energies involved yep. and the amount of radiation and I'll just, the general advice is just don't bother. Don't get a don't, telescope just, instead. Get, stay far, stay far away. So what yes. is something that is a surprising, that is surprisingly deadly? One of the biggest surprises as I was researching was, uh, was stellar nurseries of places where stars are born. And we think of them as just nebula. It's just, ooh, that's a pretty nebula and it's lit up all pretty and this is great. But it turns out they are very chaotic. They are very turbulent. There is gobs of radiation swarming through them. And if you can see the Orion Nebula through a telescope, that's that's the best way to see the Orion Nebula. If you were to actually visit the Orion Nebula, you'd be irradiated. Right. From all of the, like, the newly forming stars. The newly forming stars. And then if you want to capture and get close to a star that's forming, there's tons of turbulence and compression and hot gas and, and flows and strong magnetic fields. It's, it's the worst. Magnetic fields, by the way, play a surprisingly big role in this story. Uh, they appear in almost every chapter. It's like, surprise, magnetic fields are going to kill you. I, I recall you you did a an article, I think for space.com, about magnetars and just talked about just mm -hmm. the, the Teslas involved that, that in many <laughs> right. cases they're actually dismantling your atomic bonds at a – at a yeah. fundamental level and and that was surprising to me just like i know that magnetic fields drop off pretty quickly f from mm -hmm, distance mm -hmm. and yet still these things can put out magnetic fields that are so far out that they're going to cause you a, a bad day as you get close yeah to them. yeah we're talking magnetars are by far the strongest magnetic fields in the universe they are by far the most awesome name of any astrophysical object and we're talking about magnetic fields that are a quadrillion times stronger than the strongest magnetic fields that we can create on the earth. And with those kinds of magnetic fields, like you said, not just chemical bonds break down, but atoms become distorted. They go from being roughly s spherical to being pencil shaped. And so of course, chemistry isn't gonna work anymore with little pencil shaped atoms. So your body just like stops being a body and all your positive charges go one way and all your negative charges go another and you're vaporized. And that's like a thousand miles away from a magnetar. Right. And of course you're already dead because of the radiation, because if you, yeah, could yeah, see this it, is just yeah. what happens to the leftovers. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, c keep them coming, man. What, what, are, what are some uh, other interesting ways that uh, you figured out to, uh, to wipe a person out? Yeah, so uh, cosmic strings are uh, theoretical relics from the Big Bang. Uh, these are defects in space-time itself. Um, they could cut through a planet like a hot knife through butter. Just without blinking, these things, if they exist, they stretch from one end of the universe to the other. Uh, they might even emit gravitational waves that are strong enough to rip your body apart. Uh, you, you can, of course, die by black hole. That's like the classic... Yeah way to die in space but a giant black hole you can actually pass through the event horizon without getting harmed and then you are gonna die because you're gonna hit the singularity in you know a few seconds but in those few seconds you might you know unlock the greatest <laughs> mysteries of time and space well because you'll watch the and you'll watch the universe uh proceed more quickly than your experience, right? Right, right. Because of the extreme gravity, you won't see the entire future history of the universe. It'll be sped up to about twice as fast mm, okay. as your own internal clock. So, you know, you get to see a little bit into the future. You can't tell anyone about it right, unless they right. jump into the black hole with you. Uh, there's a whole chapter on wormholes, yeah. which are just hilariously unstable, where the most interesting part about a wormhole is that if you were to jump into one, it would instantly destabilize and would spread your body parts throughout the known universe, which is kind of cool. Um, not, you know, it's exciting to watch, but not experience. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm sure you, we talked about this. I did an interview with you as well. And you mentioned about half the book is about black holes. 
you talked about the supermassive black holes, and of course we're all very familiar with the the spaghettification as you get closer mm -hmm, to a black mm -hmm. hole. The tidal forces. Are there some other ways that a black hole can can take you out? What about those smaller black holes? Maybe even the primordial ones. Right. There might be. I, I mean, the case for primordial black holes is pretty thin, so I don't dig into them too much, but I do mention them in the book. There can be microscopic black holes that, you know, rip your heart out. There can be if you just encounter them like whoopsie. Um, there are medium black holes that uh, not just the spaghettification, but the the rotation of the black holes can spin you up like pasta on the end of a fork. Uh, merging black holes, if you get too close to merging black holes, the extreme gravitational waves will, will stretch and squeeze you like a piece of silly putty. If gas is falling into a black hole, the black hole can kill you indirectly just by sucking down some gas and making the gas heat up and start generating x-rays that boil the skin off of your bones. You don't even have to get close to the black hole and it will kill you that way. Uh, what about like the, the far, far future? If you can stick about around, it? there is no future. There's... What do you, <laughs> <laughs> if you could stick around for a long time, Oh yeah, Has you ever got any plans die. for us? I mean, like a uh, crossover no. between Katie Mack's book. <laughs> uh, no, like I, I do talk about the death of stars, the formation of a planetary nebula, how our own sun is going to die, how if you stick around on the Earth long enough, you're likely to get smacked by a civilization destroying comet or asteroid. Uh, and if you try to go somewhere else, uh, find a new star, well, that's just going to blow up too. Um, your best bet is to hang around red dwarfs because they have very, very long lifespans. And after the few, few first few hundred billion years or so, they're very, very calm. Right, right. Um, I've got a couple of questions here uh, from the audience. Uh, Unc Willie wants to know, uh, how far would, would a magnetar rip the keys out of your pocket? Oh, I don't know. I don't do your homework problems for you. Uh, you've got a quadrillion Gauss magnetic field. The force on a pair of car keys, you know, it's easy enough to lift, so it's less than a Newton force. So I don't know. I'll ballpark it at 100,000 miles. Um, Arjun asks, uh, could interstellar travel ever be safe for living beings? Right. I, I do talk about this in the book of just the realities of vacuum, the realities of space travel, the realities of the distances. One of your biggest threats when it comes to interstellar travel and even interplanetary travel is cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are spit out everywhere all the time. Uh, the sun is making cosmic rays. Dying stars are making cosmic rays. You're probably making some cosmic rays right now. They just absolutely flood the universe. These are tiny particles or nuclei traveling close to the speed of light. You don't feel one. You don't feel a hundred, you don't feel a thousand, but what they can do is they can snip apart your DNA. They can just go right in there like a tiny little bullet and cut up your DNA. Sometimes your body is able to overcome that or repair it. Sometimes it can't and you end up getting cancer. So a certain percentage of all cancers that we experience here on earth are due to cosmic rays. And that's with our thick atmosphere above us. That's with our magnetic field. That's with the heliosphere, that everything. You go out into interplanetary space and you just get nonstop cosmic rays that just build and build and build and build, increasing that radiation dose eventually you're going to get cancer from a cosmic ray. Now you can build shielding, you can do some clever things, but just the realities of interstellar distances are so vast, it's beyond our comprehension, all right? Going from one star to another is not easy. It is not short. It is not fast. It is not simple. If you... If we can envision a spacecraft actually propelling humans to another star, it's a journey of hundreds or thousands of years. So, I mean, your first enemy is going to be boredom, <laughs> let alone all the cosmic rays. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even and and if you try to shorten the trip, if you try to go faster, then you're starting to 
run across other consequences like chunks of dust hitting your spaceship at yeah at chunk of dust uh, yeah yeah chunk of dust traveling at ten thousand miles per hour okay maybe you can deal with it chunk of dust traveling at half the speed of light <laughs> that's a different thing yeah yeah um so <laughs> johnny j wants to know <laughs> when is space out on discovery channel Oh, so Space Out isn't on Discovery Channel TV. It's on discovery.com. Uh, you can just go right there, discovery.com uh, slash space out, and it'll bring you to the page. Uh, we release a video every month, and plus there's a bunch of articles written by me. Uh, Neko Girl wants to know, what's with the pink aliens behind you? Uh, oh, my chalkboard is going a little bit nuts in quarantine. It doesn't have the usual spacing. You know, so usually I visit my chalkboard at work at the office and then come back here. But now it's it's just been the two of us and it's we're getting a little stir crazy. <laughs> that sounds about right. Well, Paul, uh, again, hold up the book. Yes. With this gorgeous cover. This is uh, published by Prometheus or sorry, Pegasus, by the way. Congratulations. Um, and it was a pleasure to have you back on the show. Uh yeah. And please uh, don't be a stranger. If you've got some more interesting, right. next time you write a book, feel free to come back and let us know about sure it. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, and you can get, uh, you can order autograph copies at pmsutter.com slash book. What is the next thing that people should be keeping out for, apart from the book that you're going to be doing that maybe they should notice? Uh, that I'm doing or mm -hmm. like that's happening in the world? That you're doing. That I'm doing, uh, pay attention to the Discovery Channel. Excellent. All right, Paul, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming back. Always. And uh, good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, let's get on with the news portion of the show. Um, Alex, I'm going to let you go first. Let's talk about uh, a new uh, explanation for Oumuamua. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I don't know if you remember, but I teased this last time I was on the show about a month ago. I said that there was this new idea about Oumuamua that I thought was a uh, pretty interesting. So it's a, a friend of mine, actually, Daryl Seligman was a graduate student at Yale University working with Greg Laughlin there. He's now moved on, he's a postdoc at the University of Chicago. And they've done several papers uh, focusing on Oumuamua. And this new one, I think is a very interesting hypothesis. They say that uh, you can explain all of these sort of peculiar observations that we've seen with Oumuamua if it's made of molecular hydrogen ice. And that really sort of blew my mind. Uh, What's when we, uh, that? First talked about it. It's crazy. <laughs> so molecular hydrogen. So that's is not two... just water with that's most no, hydrogen. Yeah, it's it's H2. It's two atoms of hydrogen that have been uh, bonded together. We see it out in the universe in a gaseous form. In fact, it's you know, it's super abundant. Um, the problem is, is that it's not easy to observe. It really doesn't have these emission and absorption lines uh, like so many other um, atoms and molecules out there that are easy to see, for example, in the radio. Uh, we know there's an abundance of molecular hydrogen, but it's we kind of have to observe it indirectly. Um, so it's this is kind of this exotic idea of molecular hydrogen ice. What could this be about? So just to give the uh, viewers a little bit of context, I, I, you know, I'm sure most people are kind of familiar with Oumuamua, but just as a recap, this was the first interstellar object uh, that we saw uh, passing through the solar system. We observed it on its way out and uh, actually got a lot of observations of it, something like 30 days worth of observations of this, of this object. It had this very peculiar elongated shape, almost like a uh, like a cigar it's been described as, and it had this what we call a non-Newtonian or uh, non-gravitational uh, acceleration, meaning that uh, the way that it is, uh, the velocity is changing, cannot be due simply um, to the sun. And so there's a was a variety of uh, right. thoughts about why this should be. Um, you know, radiation pressure plays a role, but it was not enough. Um, you'd expect a comet that has all kinds of outgassing that this is going to impart some acceleration on the object, but we really didn't see any Right, we didn't see the tail. That was, that was the weird part of this thing. We never saw it sort of doing the typical comet stuff. Uh, and there was even one sort of uh, remarkable suggestion from Avi Loeb at Harvard saying, maybe this is a, a spacecraft 
And uh, obviously that got a lot of press. Uh, most astronomers were rather skeptical of it. It's usually, uh, what is the mantra? It's never aliens. <laughs> right, I mean, one day right. it might be aliens, yeah. but uh, you know, we're usually looking for something that's a little less exotic, even if it's not the, uh, obvious to us immediately what this was. So how do you kind of put together all of these observations? This is where this uh, uh, molecular hydrogen ice hypothesis comes through. And it really does a kind of a nice job. It, the energetics of how much uh, radiation that the uh, object is receiving from the sun, it kind of works out pretty well if you say that the, it's the molecular hydrogen is the explanation. And now, it could be something else like, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so just like talk me through how, how this would have formed. So you've got a cloud of hydrogen. As the hydrogen comes together, isn't it going to like heat up, become part of a star or giant planet like Jupiter, how do you get right. it to be cold? Right. So this is a, a little outside of my expertise, but um, I, I, I know a little bit about this. I think it's a compelling argument that they make. In these uh, dense cores in the giant molecular clouds where, where stars form, they can be incredibly cold and they are uh, shielded even from the cosmic microwave background. I mean, so you can get down to, you know, less than uh, three to three degrees Kelvin. And that's how cold you really need these, these things to be. In the paper, they say that only about 1% of the material in those cores uh, goes on to be the star and the rest huh. of the stuff kind of gradually disperses out into space. Now, this also accords well with the velocity that this object was observed with. It didn't really seem like it was necessarily ejected from another system. Rather, we just kind of ran into it. Um, and so that seems to be consistent with this idea that it was just kind of formed in these uh, dense cores and trickled out into space. And one last sort of feature of this is that, uh, uh, you know, this can't live terribly long. They said, you know, it would only last. It would only be about a hundred million years old. Now that sounds maybe old, but not terribly old in, in uh, sort of astronomical time scales. And if it had not come into the solar system, then it would have only lived for another thirty-seven million years. Wow! So that kind of nicely accords with this sort of mediocrity principle that we're not going to see something right after it's born or right before it's uh, dead. We kind of caught it in its right in its uh, middle age there. And, yeah. and, and that would also explain why we haven't seen a lot of these. Like, if they don't have a very long lifespan, then, I mean, this is the first. It's not a comet. It's not an asteroid. It's bordering on a brand new kind. If, if that's what it turns out to be, it's almost like it's an entirely new transient object like that. And, yeah. you know, and, and the fact that if they are wearing down very quickly, while well, a comet will last billions of years and an asteroid will last billions of years, but if these only last a few million, then it explains why we don't see them busting through the solar system on a regular basis. They don't last long. And if they do get too close, they get torn apart pretty nicely because it's, it's hydrogen. Well, but the, actually the amazing thing is that the expectation is that these things still will be seen in uh, large numbers. So we you know, kind of got lucky seeing this first one. But the expectation remains, um, uh, this is not new to this paper, but the expectation remains that you know, just the way that we happen to see this, that there must be an incredible amount of these objects around. And, and the expectation is we will see many more of these, particularly when uh, the Nancy Grace Roman uh, Telescope Fund yeah. known as LSST comes online and now we know what we're looking for, we actually do expect to see a lot of these things. And the really exciting part is that if we have one of these comet rendezvous missions, like it's kind of being talked about, comet interceptor, yeah, then we could actually go and study one of these things up close and see one of these really primordial objects, something that's pretty freshly out of uh, one of these uh, uh, dense cores in these giant molecular clouds. It's really a, a, an amazing new laboratory, if it's true. Now, this is just one Yeah, paper. yeah, but, it, but as you said, archive. I mean, the great thing about it is that, the, that this model is per perfectly explains all of the behavior of Oumuamua. Its shape, its outgassing, the way it was changing its velocity as it was moving away from the sun in unpre unpredictable ways. Right. It's perfect. Yeah. That's incredible. Exactly right. Yeah. Now it could be nitrogen, nitro, uh, molecular nitrogen. Could be neon, argon. They they briefly sort of touch on these other possibilities. Neon yeah. and argon seems a little more exotic, uh, but of course there's an enormous amount of nitrogen. So yeah. uh, you know, this is just one little piece of the puzzle trying to kind of figure this thing out. But I I found it to be a pretty fantastic, pretty, uh, compelling case. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Kimberly. Yeah, so I one thing to add to that is I find it super interesting that Oumuamua is this whole new type of thing, and then Borisov was completely ordinary. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a, just a regular like The first comment. two that we saw, and to my knowledge, the only two that we've seen so far, even though I'm sure we're right. looking even more now, um, which I think highlights to me that there may just be all sorts of different objects that we're not expecting. And it sort of reminds me of the first couple months right after Kepler came online, where every new exoplanet, every exoplanet was new and its yeah. own new thing that told yeah. us new stuff that we'd never seen before. Um, totally. So and so I I'm guess, excited. I mean, a hot Jupiter is the is like, you know, something super weird being the first thing that we find. Yeah, we're like, right. huh, that's weird. And then the next one was kind of like, mm, mm -hmm. okay, it's a comet. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully they'll be quite common eventually. You know, it, it's this point, it's kind of a joke in the exoplanet community. If you find it one planet, it's, it's, it's planet. really not enough to yes. <laughs> publish a paper on, you know. <laughs> it didn't take too long for us to get to that point, which yeah. is kind of exciting. Uh, no. And I, I no, look forward to when we have a whole thing of interstellar objects where we can just be like, Psh, whatever. Yeah. yeah, wake me up Absolutely. when we've got something we've never seen before. Right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, totally changing gears and changing gears for me too, because I don't really talk about black holes and the galaxy all that much. Um, but... As we've discussed before, our, our Milky Way galaxy has a uh, supermassive black hole in the center of it. And in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty quiet black hole. It doesn't do all that much compared to, say, an active galaxy that is, you know, eating all sorts of things and spewing out massive jets of radiation out into the universe, or is just kind of just like puttering along. Um, but about three and a half million years ago, uh, our black hole ate a very large cloud of hydrogen. Uh, and I mention this because it created these large beams, sort of like cones of light and plasma that extended upward, like northwards and southwards of the core of the galaxy. And it had, it actually uh, uh, had effects on other parts of the galaxy, thousands, hundreds of thousands of light years away that we have actually just recently observed. So in the southern part of that flash, uh, three and a half, sorry, three and a half billion years ago, I should have said, um, that southern flash actually passed through I a... It, I think it was three and a half billion. Let me, I recall... I thought it was billion. We'll look that up. Yeah, I'm going to look it's that up while you're two. talking. I, when I'm talking about yep, galaxies, three and a half million. It's, yeah. Million. Oh, yeah. I, so I, because I remember, the, I, thought that I remember was a in the press release they were saying like early hominids, if they looked in the sky, yeah. would have seen well, this. Well, I was anyway. Yeah. I was accounting for light travel time, but apparently I did it wrong. So, million. I was right the first time. Anyway, that flash of light passed through a uh, particular feature that is actually outside of our galaxy. It's called the Magellanic Stream, and it's this tidal tail of gas that's trailing off of the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds in the southern uh, part of our sky. And when this flash of light passed through the Magellanic stream, it ionized a lot of gas that was in that stream and then it had passed away into the universe and we didn't really care about it after that. But just recently, astronomers were using the Hubble Space Telescope to observe quasars through the Magellanic stream and through uh, the, what's called the leading arm, sort of like this extra little tidal bit that is in front of the trajectory of the large and small Magellanic clouds. Uh, and they were able to detect the chemical signature left behind by this really powerful flash of light that happened three and a half million years ago. Uh, and it's uh, re it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. It's called a Seifert flash, which mm -hmm. we've seen in other galaxies in the universe um, called Seifert galaxies. Uh, but generally speaking, Seifert galaxies are very active. They do this a lot. Um, and they release these powerful bursts of radiation. And our galaxy isn't one of these Seifert galaxies. So it's a, it's a strange phenomenon in the history of the Milky Way. It's a transient thing. It didn't likely happen all that often. Um, but we were able to tie it to a different feature that we've observed in the Milky Way, these bubbles of plasma that ex that exist above and below 
the, the disk of the Milky Way. And now we're sort of seeing how all of these different parts are right. interconnected, how one phenomenon that happened once created multiple ripple effects throughout different parts of the galaxy. But I, I love this idea that you've got the large and small Magellanic clouds and they are passing by, they're getting disrupted by the Milky Way into this long stream of gas. And then mm -hmm. some event, and I think they still don't really know what the event was, happened at the black hole, obviously it ate something or something. They know. think it was like a, a, a giant cloud of hydrogen gas, something like a hundred thousand right. suns in mass. <laughs> right, went into it was, the black it was hole. A while ago. It just like yeah. you know, got yeah. got eaten yeah. and then there was a burp. Yeah, like and so he, then you got this like black this, holes do. this flash of energy yeah. and and growing radiation and sort of this bubble of hot gas that's expanding outward from the center of the Milky Way and the light from this passes through and it just happened to pass through, through the Magellanic stream tail. yeah and lights it up and yep. and they were saying i it wasn't well, it in, the, just in lit the hubble it, one it not just lit it up but it stripped away all sorts of electrons it ionized yeah. uh from everything from hydrogen up to like the like four ionization states of carbon which is a really really powerful energy flash that can really only be done with a very high energy event like a Seifert clash. Yeah, and so they're saying that that it would have been a ghostly glow across the sky visible to the unaided eye for about a million years. And so you would have just been standing there looking up and you would just see this glow in the sky. Or, you know, you would live event. and die and you would think that that's how it's supposed to be all yeah, the time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you wouldn't see it as a, as a, although it would be interesting to see sort of the moment. If it was the one day that it appeared out of nowhere. Yeah, like, I wonder huh, if it would happen that? that quickly. Yeah, yeah. Or it would just like slowly build and get brighter and brighter and brighter. But, but it's, it's kind of amazing to think like there are these, you know, as Paul was talking about, there are these cataclysmic events that happen around the universe. And yet when we look into the sky, we see everything's just we sort see of a seen, snapshot of it. Yeah, we see a snapshot. Everything looks kind of the same. But, you know, like we can see the the, um, uh, you know, the remnants of supernovae. We can see planetary nebulae. We can see these these objects that are the result of these these events that happen in time and of course quasars and seifert galaxy as well so to and be now we see what a seifert galaxy looks like when it turns off yeah yeah exactly uh, which we absolutely can't fascinating. do when we look out there yeah um it's good have you been this is of course the american astronomical society virtual version of their meeting have you been tracking it all how's it been working out for you i have not been tuning into um this particular double as meeting um and i I don't generally do for the summer meeting. Um, there is a lot happening right now in the world. And I think we're all just trying to keep up. I've been yep. reading the press releases, but I've not been attending virtually. Exactly the same. I've been I've been reading the press well, releases. Apologies been... to the astronomers. You're all doing very interesting stuff. Kudos yeah. to doing all of this yeah. in these particular times. Yeah, yeah they didn't um, uh, they didn't choose the time to, all, to release their news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, super fascinating. Uh, Morgan, what have you got for us? Razor, do you know what an F bot is? An F bot? Yes. No. I know. It sounds a little scandalous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's why I want to talk about this because this came across my desk uh, over the weekend. And I, it's not that often where you're like, holy cow, I didn't, there's like a whole new kind of thing that <laughs> I didn't know anything about. So F bot stands for Fast Blue Optical Transient. Uh, and it's basically a fancy way of saying something blue appears and then it goes away. Uh, and these things, aren't visible to the naked eye, at least not the ones we've seen yet, but they are visible to telescopes. And it's not exactly clear what they are, but they seem pretty awesome. Uh, so astronomers first identified them as sort of a unique, interesting uh, feature back in 2014. And our best guess is basically that there's some special class of supernova. But compared to normal supernova, your type 1a or even your type 2, uh, the f-bots get bright faster and then they get dim faster. And so they seem to be this sort of flash in the pan. And they can literally reach peak brightness in just a few days uh, and reach peak brightness at other wavelengths within months. And that makes it really challenging to uh, coordinate some sort of observing campaign around them, which is probably why we haven't 
noticed them and detected them more regularly in the past. So we think that probably you go back all the way back to Palomar, there's probably pictures of these things and nobody happened to notice <laughs> until recently. And now we're starting to find them more. And this most recent one, which has some God awful name, uh, was first noticed in 2016 by an automated telescope uh, on uh, Catalina that was looking specifically for supernovae. Uh, and what was interesting was they actually were able to follow this one up with a multi-spectral um, fleet of both ground-based and space-based uh, instruments. And, and what really stuck out to me is how powerful this is. Uh, what's, what they found was that it was accelerating material to about 55% the speed of light. And on its own, that's not crazy. Like gamma ray bursts. It feels crazy. During, it feels crazy. I have to admit, the paper describes this as mildly relativistic, <laughs> which is yeah. kind of burying your lead if uh, if I've ever ever seen it. So 55% the speed of light, which as supernovae go is not insane. Gamma ray bursts causing supernova can accelerate stuff to this speed. The difference is how much material is put at that speed. So they found that in this one event, about one-tenth of a solar mass was accelerated to 55% the speed of light. And that's like a hundred thousand times more than your typical gamma ray burst. So we're talking like a crazy explosion. Uh, and one of the other reasons that it doesn't seem like we've noticed these before is because they all seem to be happening in small galaxies, like really small dwarf galaxies. And in fact, we didn't even know of the dwarf galaxy that this guy was in until this got really bright. And then a bunch of people looked and, oh, look, there's a dwarf galaxy. And the, the idea is, is that many dwarf galaxies uh, because they have relatively few stars and they haven't gone through a lot of stellar life cycles, they're pretty metal poor. And of course, when we talk about metals, we're talking about everything that's heavier than hydrogen or helium. And so the stars that are in these galaxies are really metal poor. And it turns out that the less metal your star has, the less of its mass it sheds over its mm. lifetime. And so what we're probably seeing are stars that are especially massive for their class uh, that retain that mass all the way up to the point of supernova and then basically blow open in like a super violent version of a supernova. And because all that energy is expended so quickly, that's why it gets bright and then dim again really, really fast. And because there's all of that energy, it can accelerate a much larger fraction of the star's outer layers to these mildly relativistic uh, speeds. And so that sounds very similar to the kinds of stars that were thought to be at the beginning of the universe, these pop three stars that were made of just primordial hydrogen and helium. And this is the same thing. Astronomers have estimated that these could have been hundreds, thousands, possibly tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun before they detonated perfectly, right? Yeah. Going and and it makes you, you know, kind of channeling Paul, it makes you think about like, what a horrible place <laughs> the early universe must have been because, you know, all around you, these giant stars are just popping off. Yeah. And they're sending, you know, sun sized chunks of material traveling at the speed of light out in random directions. It, it doesn't sound great. Yeah. But it is interesting to think, I, I mean, again, I guess, again, we're going to reference Paul here, that, that you would think that these dwarf galaxies would be calm and chill and a pretty, you know, nonviolent place to hang out. And suddenly, you've got them, you know, because they haven't gone through the same number of generations, and they haven't gotten polluted in the way that stars in a larger spiral galaxy that our own are, they actually would have, and they're kind of smaller in a you know, more cramped area, you end up with much more powerful, much more deadly supernova detonations than the kinds of stuff that we might experience. Yeah, I mean, it's like black here. holes. You don't think of big black holes as being the nice ones. <laughs> But, but they are because things work weirdly when you get to these really big yeah. uh, scales. And I just think it's so cool that, you know, we've probably been observing these for like 100 years and, and just never noticed. And, and you wonder how much is like hidden away yeah. in the Hubble back catalog and in Palomar and in all of yeah. these surveys that we just like totally missed yeah and there's probably some just like amazing stuff in there and when you think when the vera rubin comes online and suddenly we've got a, a purpose-made device looking for this and anything that moves uh we're just going to have mountains of them pouring out into the uh, petabytes of data that are coming out of that telescope 
which is going to be, be awesome. pretty amazing. Yeah. I wonder, um, do we do we know what kind of a remnant, if any? I know that some of those bigger stars, they just detonate and they leave no remnant behind. They're just completely gone. Yeah, I, that I don't know. I think the, the the core, I think they were saying, would have become a black hole. I mean, this is a big, a big supernova. Um, uh, and the other option, so I've been talking all of supernova. They can't prove it's a supernova. The other option is that you have a medium-sized star that's getting like shredded by a black hole <laughs> and it like loses it all at once, basically. Just go. Uh, and, and so that's not great either. I mean, there's no good, no happy endings <laughs> right. to, yeah. um, to this story. Uh, but yeah, so it's either a star becoming a black hole or a black hole Eating consuming a star. A star. Oh, it's an absolutely amazing story. Um, fantastic. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit, of course, uh, about the incredible launch of the SpaceX Dragon 2 uh, cap crew Dragon capsule that launched. Uh, we were, I think last week we were right as it scrubbed. Um, and so we we're saying that it was going to launch again on Saturday or Sunday. I believe I made a bunch of hilarious jokes about how rockets never launch. Uh, but it actually did end up uh, launching on Saturday at around three o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, the launch went picture perfect. It was able to successfully uh, detach from its first stage, which came down and landed in the on the drone ship out in the ocean. Uh, and then the second stage carried it to orbit. It detached from the second stage and then under its own power, it closed the distance and docked with the International Space Station. Like everything went as planned. Well, so I think that was the, the craziest thing, right? Is that it felt like any other Falcon 9 launch and you know, there's been seemingly hundreds of them now. Uh, and like, you know, all the way up to the moment of launch, the the like scariest part was like, were the clouds suddenly going to appear? Yes. Uh, you know, we were all on edge to the end. Not that the rocket wouldn't work, but that you know we were going to have to wait another day to to see it work perfectly. And that's just such a testament to just how well oiled everything seems to be uh, for Falcon and and Dragon right now. And that was just, it was just fun. And we yeah. kind of needed a little fun. And so, and so what's interesting, you know, if we sort of go back in the history, of course, um, it's been 15 years since um, NASA Administrator Mike Griffin, um, I think in 2006, said that they would set aside $500 million of NASA's budget to start developing a private solution to getting astronauts to space. They knew the space shuttle was dangerous, was aging, and it had too many just really fundamental flaws in the way it was designed to continue on performing the service of carrying astronauts to the International Space Station. Originally, they provided contracts to SpaceX and this other company called Kistler Aero Rocket Plane, which eventually went bankrupt. Uh, then in 2011, they expanded the program. They called it the COTS program, the Commercial Orbital... Oh, I forget the rest of it. Um, uh, but it was essentially the same thing to hire companies to essentially to pay for seats on spacecraft as opposed to building from scratch their own spaceships as they had done throughout the entire history of NASA. Apollo, Apollo, Gemini, Mercury, the space shuttle. These were all built by NASA, run by NASA. They were NASA's vehicles. Same thing for the space launch system. But with the with the commercial crew program, they were paying for seats by other commercial providers. They paid for a bunch of uh, contracts with SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, United Launch Alliance, a bunch of other companies, some of which are no longer in business back in 2011 and this began this long program of spacex building the crew dragon and boeing settled on their cst starliner uh back in 2015 we started to see some of the initial tests and originally they, we thought that these things would be flying you know that much earlier but it actually still took until now for these to finally fly the per seat cost for flying on Dragon is about $55 million. The per seat cost on the CST Starliner is about $90 million, although that's still a little bit debatable. But NASA had been paying Russia about $80 million for Soyuz flights to go up to the International Space Station. So suddenly, now, thanks to the launch with Crew Dragon, NASA has the ability, the United States has the ability to send its own astronauts up to the International Space Station 
to carry out these kinds of missions and then bring them back safely back into the United States at a price that's cheaper than what um, Russia was uh, was charging. And well, of course, think, hearing... about what you kind of, think about what you just kind of said there. You know, this was a program that was initiated in the Bush administration. Uh, Ish, no, initiated in, out... in, the, in the Griffin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Back in well, 2006. In, the, yeah. in President yeah. Bush, yeah. Uh, George W. Bush admission, administration continued through the Obama administration and brought to fruition in the Trump administration. I would challenge you to name one other piece of human spaceflight that has had a life even half that long. And and so look what happened. It worked. Yeah. It's like it's if we stick with something, yes. it works. It works. Yeah. And oh, this man, is the so thing true. that we've stuck with. And oh my goodness, here we are. It worked. It was cheaper. It it's going to be safer and more reliable because we stuck with it. And if we could just stick with something else, whatever that thing was, Oh yeah. my gosh, that would work too. Yeah, as long as you don't change the targets. Uh, so now with the with the the ship attached docked to the to the International Space Station, they're going to be up there. They're joining uh, an, an existing expedition, but DM one essentially this test mission, or oh, sorry, DM two will end when this Crew Dragon returns back to Earth safely, sort of completing the entire life cycle of the Crew Dragon. But already. Uh, NASA has put on the books their next, um, their first pure crew flight. It's going to have four astronauts on board. It's probably going to fly in October, and they've already booked probably the next flight after that, which is going to fly in early 2021. We're still waiting on the CST Starliner to do its proper test flight. Of course, it had a, a an accident um, back in December, was unable to make it to orbit. And uh, so there, so NASA has had them go back and fix a long list of, of issues. We sh hopefully will see their, te their proper test again this fall and probably sometime next year, they'll start sending passengers to the International Space Station as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, because this is commercial, because NASA is paying for flights on these on these rockets, um, these companies are free to offer their services to other people. And so um, a company called Space Adventures has already hired SpaceX to send people on a space tourism mission to essentially take a high altitude orbit around the Earth, essentially at a higher altitude than the International Space Station, pretty much higher than any humans have gone since the Apollo mission. Uh, roughly what they You're were doing. Put that Gemini. sweet uh, Universe Today money uh, down for uh, a seat on the, on the first one. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll I'll wait. Uh, you know, I'll wait till other people safely return from space. But I do think that's the perfect flight that you take off, go around the Earth, get a really nice high altitude flight, spend some time in true weightlessness, come back to Earth later that day have a nice dinner and and regale your friends yeah, with your way better adventure. than those five minutes of weightlessness that you're going to get yeah, on, yeah. on the other guys but you are going to pay you know you're going to pay oh, probably yeah. tens of millions of dollars to take this flight um and also there is a private uh, space station uh, module that's going to be attached to the International Space Station probably in uh, 2024 by a company called Axiom and when that happens then in theory paying passengers will be able to go on a SpaceX Crew Dragon fly to this private space station module, spend a week in space, and then come back to Earth, and not get in the way of the astronauts as they do their work. Um, and and this will be additional revenue for SpaceX. So uh, again, that incentive of paying for SpaceX to develop this whole flight system is now hopefully going to help allow constant iterations and improvements and it's going to be the best game in town until i guess starship comes along which you know right now starships just explode so, so speaking of 2024 has there been any new talk about artemis and how this may fit into that no the they are two completely different programs so crew dragon is not able to make that long haul flight to to say the deep space gateway and definitely not to the moon although uh i'm sure it could be modified to make a trip to the to the deep space gateway um they, they back 
several years ago came up with a larger version of the crew dragon that had more of a caboose on it. Um, but no, right now, NASA is still 100% on board with the space launch system, except that they've now opened up. We talked, Morgan and talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that they've opened up the opportunity for SpaceX to launch parts of the, of the mission on, on Falcon heavies. So the dam on that side is actually starting to break and we may very well see uh, the space launch system be completely phased out if if SpaceX just continues to charge forward the way they are. So just between you and me, what's your uh, what's your feeling there? Do you think it'll the dam will break enough? That... I think we will see a few launches of the space launch system, but it won't. But then other the commercial spacecraft will take over largely from that point forward. So I think we'll see like maybe three, maybe four. Like we'll see a Europa Clipper, we'll see a test flight, we'll see a couple of modules of the Deep Space Gateway, and we'll see uh, a flight to the moon. And then I think there will be replacements for all of it at vastly cheaper prices. I mean, yeah, when well, you look they, at... They can't get the money for Europa Clipper unless they tie it to SLS. So that's well, how the money is built into the budget. Or, the they can, or they can do it way cheaper flying on a Falcon Heavy. I mean, they could do... Right, it, but that's not how the, the, mon the mission is getting funded, though. Yet, but at the, the moment, but eventually the it'll be so at much cheaper that yeah. there will just be no defense. Yeah, yeah, and so the, I mean the the at this point, right, a flight on a Falcon Heavy costs you ninety million, and the SLS is going to cost you a one and a half billion. So it's just one it's, of those get... is not like the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just, I mean, it is just a, a the space launch system is just a. A launch system of a of a previous an older time and and it really does show you how much SpaceX has changed everything just every way that we think about rockets and rocket systems now if your system isn't partly or fully reusable you're not even going to be co competitive anymore there's a great article on Ars Technica today by Eric Berger talking about the Falcon 9 uh, as the sort of workhorse of, of space now and made the interesting observation that, you know, SpaceX launched their next generation rocket 10 years ago, <laughs> and we haven't yet seen anyone else launch a next generation yeah. uh, rocket. And so they're, they have a 10 year, at least head start on, on everybody else. And they certainly don't seem to be taking that uh, time to, to sit yeah. down. And, and I mean, obviously Elon Musk is excited about what's going to happen with Starship, but they could continue to iterate both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy and, gobble up the entire launch market not to mention launching another batch of starlinks what tonight tonight i think yeah it hasn't been canceled it's like an hour from now yeah yeah so just more could starlinks we, we just not <laughs> that one of these actually this is important because one of the starlinks tonight is going to have one of these visors on board so oh yeah okay so it's going to hopefully they're going to they're going to take another crack at darkening the brightness of these satellites and it should be a much more significant drop in in brightness than just painting it black because painting it black only dropped it from like magnitude five to magnitude six and this so in the be... next couple of days i should see a paper on the archive about the effectiveness well it'll this. take a couple of weeks or a month or two for it to reach its final altitude so we can see what the effectiveness is that but... doesn't mean that astronomers won't complain in the meantime yeah but i mean i th hope they'll be like a little hopeful the goal is magnitude eight if they can get these to magnitude eight astronomers will be happy less unhappy less unhappy yeah. that's the yeah. phrase <laughs> yeah. less unhappy yeah. all right <clears throat> we've reached the end of our show kimberly you're on my screen what are you working on oh boy what am i working on I swear I was working on something. Um, new discoveries about the ocean floor that came from searching for a missing airplane, which I thought was pretty fascinating. So that should be up on eos.org sometime next week. And in the meantime, always you can follow me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. All awesome. Those things. Morgan, what are you working on? I have been living in the world of quantum mechanics lately, and it is not a place that I am comfortable. <laughs> uh, but out of it has come a couple of cool videos for SciShow that should appear sometime in the next month. Uh, one's all about quantum cognition, the idea that we can use the tools of quantum mechanics to understand the brain. Not that quantum mechanics is how the brain works, but that we can use the, the mathematical tools to figure out what's going on, and turns out you can. So you're telling uh, us another... that the brain is all quantum mechanics? 
Oh, all the way down. Yeah. Uh, like and, and another Chopra. about how right. uh, you can use <laughs> a weird property of quantum mechanics to slow photons down to the speed of a bicycle. Uh, and that this might be the key to uh, adding memory to your next quantum computer. So we can so outrun the speed at, of light, outcycle the yes. speed of light. It, it, if you cycle hard. Yeah. Um, YouTube.com slash SciShow to see those sometime in the next month. Awesome. Alex, what are you working on? Ah, uh, you know me. I'm always a broken record here, working on my dissertation, trying to fi finish that sucker off, and yeah. uh, pontificating on Twitter as always. At Alex Tucci. I think that is the key to <laughs> to getting you your doctorate is just you having to come on every couple of weeks and just you mm -hmm. know, yeah, tell us how it's going. Exactly. Yeah, it's going well. Have you my you gotta start got to start pressuring him for page counts. Yeah, Make yeah. Sure how many words have you pressuring added? Pressuring him for page counts. Yeah. My, uh, it's just cruel. It's, it's definitely over 300 pages, I think, at this point. It's, it's well, I think you're done. Man, my dissertation was like 105 pages or something. Slacker, <laughs> my mine introduction. Was 350. Wow. Oh, yeah, I am. I'm not a good student. <laughs> yeah, you got the yeah hey i'm enjoying fine. it right now i'm enjoying it oh that's great and uh if people want to follow you where can they go yeah go to twitter at, at alex teaching just my name fantastic all right and obviously uh i'm continuing i i seem to know a lot about crew dragon and that's because i did a video about this and should be releasing probably in the next day or so as well a new question show uh, another virtual star party coming up on sunday night so come and join us all right i'm gonna put everybody on the screen there we all are. Uh, although he is no longer here, uh, big thanks to our good friend, uh, Dr. Paul Sutter for gracing us with his presence and uh, shamelessly self-promoting his new book. We were glad to help and uh, I can't wait to see this on shelves. Good luck, Paul. Um, thank you everyone watching both on YouTube and on Twitter. Thanks to the moderators. Special thanks as always to Nancy Graziano for keeping us all organized. We will see all of you Next week, everybody stay safe, please. So we can't see everyone Take next care, week. Take care, everyone. And stream.